This year will come to order, and uh, I want to thank our distinguished witnesses for appearing before this subcommittee today. Today, the Reading Subcommittee will hear about wind farm development and its impact on military readiness. And overall, I am committed to renewable energy and the benefits it provides to the environment, the economy, and of course, our country. However, this project should not be pursued at the expense of military readiness. Wind energy is a prime example of renewable energy, and although it is currently only 2% of domestic electricity supply, it is the fastest growing source of new energy generation in our country. According to the Department of Energy, the United States has enough wind resources to generate electricity for every home and business in this nation. But not all areas are appropriate for wind energy development. Today, the industry is generating 14 times more wind energy across the United States than only 10 years ago. This increase is only expected to continue. There are a variety of factors that contribute to the growth of wind energy, and one of the most prominent being federal subsidies and stimulus, stimulus money available to the industry. A Department of Energy grant program entitles developers of renewable energy to 30% reimbursement of the cost of building a facility. Wind power projects were the largest sector, receiving 86% of the nearly $2.6 billion that was disbursed. But what stipulations are attached to the funding to protect military readiness? Uh, of course, the interest of our readiness so that we can be ready in case that uh, we need to defend ourselves and our allies. The rise of wind farms could not be more apparent than in my home state of Texas. We lead the country in wind power capacity and generate one quarter of the nation's entire production, or approximately 9,000 megawatts. This is enough electricity to power more than 2.5 million homes for one year. In my district alone, the stimulus bill provided more than 440 million in direct contributions to wind farms. With the rise of wind energy, industry continues to seek attractive development locations, some of which are too close to military installations. A great example of this type of development is in my district at the Naval Air Station in Kingsville, Texas. As one can see in the slide uh, showing on the screen, wind farms will significantly impair the ability of the Kingsville radar system to monitor and detect small aircraft like those flown at the Naval Air Station. We might ask ourselves, is this a problem? It is a, a serious problem. Is there anything that we can do to preserve the military capabilities threatened by wind farm? By the development at Naval Air Station Kingsville and other military bases? In the short term, no. Am I concerned? You bet I am concerned. The Department of Defense has increasingly engaged to express reservations or objections to potential energy projects based on military readiness issues, specifically identifying conflicts with radars and existing training routes. Each application for wind farm development is reviewed by the Federal Aviation Administration in coordination with the Department of Defense. However, I am deeply concerned about the lack of a coordinated, well-established review process within the Department of Defense to provide timely input for these green energy projects. As a committee, we address this concern in the fiscal year 2011 National Defense Authorization Act and look forward to working with the Senate to refine the final language in conference. I don't consider it to be in our government's best interest to stunt the growth of this critical industry. 
nor to expand wind farm development at the expense of military readiness. There are many different facets of this issue and a variety of stakeholders. As subsidies continue and the industry continues to grow, it is imperative to increase coordination between the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy on, on these efforts. Beyond government coordination, industry as a whole needs to take ownership of their role in diminishing the impacts of wind farms on military readiness and increase innovation to reduce conflicts with military radars and training routes. To that end, I want to hear what specific actions the government and industry partners are taking to, number one, improve the review process to identify mitigation efforts and invest in research and development solutions. I want to conclude my opening statement by restating my commitment to pursue all energy, energy solutions in partnership with the administration, but not again at the expense of military readiness. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that we have a lot to discuss today, and I look forward to hearing your, you address these important issues. The chair at this moment recognizes my good friend from Virginia, Mr. Forbes, for any remarks that he would like to make. Mr. Forbes. Mr. Chairman, as always, I thank you uh, for your leadership, and I thank all of our witnesses. Dr. Robbins, always great to see you here again. And, uh, General, it's good to have you uh, here with us, and to, to both of our other witnesses, we appreciate your time and expertise in coming this morning to testify. Uh, this is a topic that we're all particularly excited about, um, especially the possibility of harnessing wind energy, because the chairman and I, I think, can both agree that we have an abundance of excess wind right here in the Capitol that we would love to use in a more beneficial manner. And I know all of you have suggestions for us, but even if we fail there, I don't uh, think there's any question that the United States needs to do more to develop renewable energy sources. And wind farms are the most um, attractive options for truly clean, renewable energy. Uh, recently, wind farms have grown significantly in popularity, so it's important that we take the time to carefully evaluate the placement of wind farms around the country, because like a lot of things in life, wind farms are a mixed blessing, clean, renewable energy, but also an impediment, as the chairman has mentioned, to military readiness and homeland defense. Chairman's also mentioned, and our witnesses will cover in some detail, wind farm impacts. I share his concerns, which were raised in some detail at a subcommittee hearing earlier this year. I believe that wind farm development, while important to our national energy security posture, must not be allowed to impede military readiness, and I think all of us agree with that. The Department of Defense's real concerns have to do with the interference of air defense radar ringing the entire nation, as well as the obstructions created on low-level military training routes that crisscross vast areas of the interior United States opposed by wind farm development. As it stands today, the department lacks a one-stop shop for determining impacts, leading developers to be unsure of where to turn. As we've seen, mere proximity to a military installation is only the beginning of the story. The most obvious place for DOD to start is with a streamlined, transparent process that provides developers some guidelines for turbine placement and some certainty that their applications will receive a timely and credible review. Unfortunately, the current process forces the Federal Aviation Administration to solicit and represent DOD in the review. While the FAA clearly needs to be involved in the placement of 500-foot tall structures, that agency should not be forced to represent DOD equities. I look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses on constructive ways to improve the process in order to speed approval of wind farms that do not interfere with our national security or military readiness. And Again, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for scheduling this hearing, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, sir. Today we have a panel of distinguished witnesses representing a, a good cross-section of, of views, including the Department of Defense, uh, the Federal Aviation Administration, and the industrial perspectives. Our witnesses include doc, uh, Dr. Dorothy Robine. Doctor, good to see you again. Welcome. She's the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Installations and Environment, Department of Defense, and Major General Lawrence Stusrim, Director of Plans, Policy, and Strategy for North American Aerospace Defense Command, 
and the United States Northern Command General. Welcome, sir. Ms. Nancy Kalokwiski. Sounds very Spanish to me. I hope I pronounced it right. <laughs> She's the Vice President for System Operation Services of the Air Traffic Organization and in the Federal Aviation Administration. And Mr. Stu Webster, co-chair of the American Wind Energy Association uh, sitting committee. Without objection, the witnesses prepared statement will be accepted for the record. And Secretary Robine, welcome, and it is good to see you, and you can begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Forbes. It's, uh, it's great to be here talking about uh, an issue that uh, General Stutzreem and I have spent uh, uh, quite a bit of time dealing with in, uh, in, in recent months. It's an important issue. Uh, as, you, if, as you have explained in your opening statements, wind turbines can, under some circumstances, create interference and clutter that reduces the sensitivity and performance of radar, particularly older radar. The vast majority of all proposed wind turbines raise absolutely no concerns for the Department of Defense. In a small fraction of cases, however, we do have concerns and that number could grow as wind energy development expands. <clears throat> the problem arises in three different contexts. The first involves the long-range radars managed by NORAD and U.S. NORTHCOM uh, to maintain airspace surveillance and air defense. Second, turbines can affect DOD's ability to test a weapons, new weapon system, which requires an electromagnetically pristine environment in which to collect performance data. Third, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, nearest and dearest to your heart, the department's training mission can suffer if air traffic control radars used to train pilots are degraded by interference. Two key factors aggravate what would otherwise be a much more limited problem. First is the aging nature of our radar infrastructure. Our long-range radars are particularly old, decades old. Many still use analog technology which has limited ability to filter out wind turbine clutter. Second, the FAA's siting review, or its OE slash AAA, obstacle evaluation airsport, airport analysis, um, I'm, I'm missing a word, process, OE AAA process, on which we, the department, relies to identify and prevent potential interference problems is itself a kind of a legacy system. It was developed in the 60s with a focus on airspace safety and has not been updated to take account of uh, current uh, national security needs and operations. Most significant, a developer only has to give the FAA 30 days notice of the start of construction of a wind turbine or other object. This is generally adequate for the FAA's purposes but if we raise a concern at that late stage, particularly on something like a large wind farm uh, for which uh, uh, the developer has by then gotten uh, environmental permits, uh, typically hundreds of millions of dollars of investment, uh, we can create serious financial and execution challenges for the, de for the developer. The wind turbine radar interference problem is a serious problem, but it is a largely solvable problem. Our country should not have to choose between national security and the development of renewable energy. The key is to improve our legacy systems, both the, regu the regulatory one as well as the electromagnetic one. Let me, let me focus on three points. First and most immediately, the federal government needs to improve the process for reviewing renewable projects so that potential interference can be identified early and mitigated more easily. Toward this end, and consistent with your proposed legislation, we are working to stand up a central DOD clearinghouse to which developers can come on a voluntary basis early in the development process for our review of a proposed wind energy project. Our goal is to create a streamlined, transparent, and layered process one that can improve easy cases quickly and apply increasingly sophisticated tools, analytic tools, to the harder cases. Among other things, we are looking at whether we need statutory or other authority in order to protect pro proprietary project information, which is ne a necessary uh, requirement if we're going to have developers come, come to seek us out. Um, second, key federal agencies, including DOD, 
need to realign their research and development priorities to give greater attention to this issue. Technology must become one of the military's primary means of protection in this domain, just as it is in many other domains. Toward this end, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy has recently convened an interagency group to develop an R&D plan in this area. Uh, and the Air Force recently entered a cooperative R&D agreement with Raytheon aimed at identifying hardware and software improvements that will make radar less susceptible to wind turbine interference. Third, federal agencies need to look at the current plan for upgrading the older surveillance radar. At least two questions merit analysis. One is the current schedule for upgrading the radar sufficiently aggressive. For example, many of our uh, older long-range radar will not go through this upgrade process called a SLEP, Service Life Extension Program, until 2014. Uh, and second, will the technology slated for insertion as part of that SLEP process do an adequate job of mitigating wind turbine interference? And I'll return to that, that point in a minute. To illustrate the importance of technology, let me briefly mention a 60-day study by MIT's Lincoln Laboratory, which uh, we're releasing uh, a summary of today. It was completed last week. Uh, they briefed the department on it Friday and yesterday, and we're, we've made a, a one-page summary avail available to you, and we're in the process of scheduling briefings, which will be at the, at the secret level. Um, we, um, th this Lincoln Lab focused on a, uh, an, a, a long-range radar in Fossil, Oregon. It's called the Fossil Arcer 3. Arcer stands for Air Route Surveillance Radar. Fossil refers to the nearby town in Oregon, not to the age of the radar. It's old, but it's not that old. Uh, the department asked Lincoln Lab to do this analysis in late April during a controversy that I think you all are familiar with over a proposed 338 turbine wind farm project in Oregon, Shepherd's Flat. <clears throat> we withdrew, we the department withdrew our initial objection to the project, uh, partly I would say actually largely in the belief that Lincoln Lab could identify ways to mitigate the interference uh, during the, the period that the turbines were being constructed. And Lincoln Lab did not let us down. Their options, uh, based on actual experiments they ran on the fossil radar, range from adjusting the settings to optimize the existing technology to inserting new technology, such as an adaptive clutter map that can edit out false targets. Some of the technologies that Lincoln Lab believes hold promise are scheduled for insertion as part of the 2014 upgrade or SLEP process. We are eager to take the Lincoln Lab proposals to the next stage, uh, namely to engineer and demonstrate them in the field. Uh, they're not, I don't mean to imply they're a silver bullet, they're focused on this one particular radar. Uh, and the emphasis of our uh, pilot effort would be how the new technologies will affect the operation of the radar by NORAD and US NORTHCOM. Ideally, we would like to use Fossil Oregon's long-range radar as our test bed in effect accelerating the SLEP, the upgrade uh, improvements that would not otherwise take place till 2014. In addition to improving the Oregon radar on an accelerated basis, this pilot will yield lessons that we can apply to other ARCER-3 radars as part of this process. In closing, <clears throat> let me say that to maintain military readiness in homeland defense, we must protect our irreplaceable test and training ranges. Uh, and maintain our radar-based surveillance network. At the same time, the department supports the development of wind energy as a means toward greater energy security goals, and we ourselves have been a leader in the development of renewable energy. These two sets of goals can and should be compatible. I've identified broad changes necessary to reduce many, if not all, admittedly not all, uh, conflicts. Uh, we look forward to working with you to implement these changes in the months ahead. Thank you. General. Chairman Ortiz, uh, it's great to see you again, sir. Congressman Forbes and members of the subcommittee, good morning. It's an honor to appear before you today to discuss the impact of these wind turbines on homeland defense, and I'm pleased to accompany Dr. Robine to represent the and to represent the men and women of uh, NORAD and, and U.S. NORTHCOM. 
We are responsible for homeland defense, civil support, security cooperation to defend and secure the United States and its interests. In all domains, air, maritime, land, our focus is on defense of the homeland. NORAD provides aerospace warning, aerospace control, and maritime warning in the defense of North America. The FAA's radars provide us the situational awareness and threat detection capability we need to defend the nation's airspace. Under certain circumstances, wind turbines and other radar obstructions cause interference that degrades these radars and it jeopardizes our ability to defend the United States and Canada. Of the 214 FAA radars that provide our domestic radar coverage, 13 currently operate with some form of degradation due to wind turbine induced interference. In uh, 2009, NORAD processed uh, 1,789 tracks of interest, including an airplane that was stolen uh, from a flight school in Thunder Bay, Ontario, and of course the Christmas Day attempted bombing on uh, Northwest Flight 253. This year we've already processed over 700 tracks of interest. Each track has a unique set of circumstances and demands clear situational awareness. Our decision time is measured in minutes. We know that our nation's future depends upon a strong defense. We also recognize that harnessing alternative energy sources is critical to our nation's future. We understand the importance of projects that enable our nation's energy independence and we fully support their development. We review proposals for new developments such as wind farms, commercial buildings, other structures, and assess whether they will hinder our ability to keep North America safe. We provide our assessment to the FAA who then renders a determination of hazard. I want to stress that situations where the FAA renders a determination of hazard on our behalf do not occur frequently. In fact, we've supported over 87 percent of the 2,196 proposed wind turbines that we've evaluated since 2008. I'm also pleased today to be joined by the American Wind Energy Association and the FAA. And we, along with other organizations within the Department of Defense and federal government, are actively engaged with the private sector, alternative energy organizations to identify best practices and improve wind farm siting procedures. NORAD and U.S. NORTHCOM are committed to participate in this interagency process that evaluates proposals for wind farms and other developments with the potential to obstruct radar signals. All of this is done with the defense of our homeland as our primary consideration. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity to answer any questions you may have. Ms. Kalowski, you go ahead. You're next. Thank you very much, Chairman Ortiz, Congressman Forbes, and members of the subcommittee. We appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Nancy Kalinowski, and I am the Vice President for System Operations Services for the Federal Aviation Administration. My office evaluates the impact of proposed construction on the national airspace system and determines whether it is a hazard to air navigation. The FAA's mission is to ensure the safe and efficient use of aircraft in the national airspace system. Proponents of construction projects must give adequate public notice when the proposed structure could impact the safety or the efficiency of the national airspace system. This notice provides the FAA with the opportunity to identify the potential aeronautical hazards to minimize any adverse impacts to aviation. The FAA uses an online tool that allows the public to file electronically and to track their proposals online. We evaluate approximately 100,000 proposed construction filings every year, including wind turbines. Wind turbine proposals have grown exponentially. In 2003, the FAA received just over 3,000 wind turbine filings. In the first six months of 2010, we have already received close to 19,000 wind turbine filings. We expect that number to increase substantially as the country prioritizes renewable energy. 
we have approved over 100,000 wind turbine projects since 2003. Wind turbines present a unique challenge to our agency because of the special characteristics and the potential to the impacts on the airspace and our air navigation facilities. In the case of wind farm evaluations, each wind farm, each wind turbine is evaluated separately. The cumulative effect of the wind turbines on navigable airspace will obviously be more significant based on the total number of wind turbines grouped together. When the wind turbine blades spin, and in some instances it's at more than 200 miles per hour, the signal can be picked up by radars as clutter. The clutter created by wind turbines can result in a complete loss of primary long-range radar detection above a wind turbine farm. When a radar system repeatedly sees a return this large from its signal, the radar may not be able to detect an actual aircraft in the area. Consequently, there are real and significant issues that must be evaluated by the government before its approval of wind turbine projects. How can we address these issues? The federal government can better serve our interests and those of the energy developers by improving the filing and the communication process. FAA is continually enhancing its public website to improve the filing process and to add tools that assist developers with citing wind turbine projects. The FAA also hosts a DOD preliminary screening tool that allows proponents to assess if their proposed locations for wind turbines would be in an acceptable geographic area in relation to radar locations. This month, we added a new mapping tool on our website that depicts wind turbine determinations issued by the FAA in every state. This tool will allow the developers to more easily identify areas that are already congested with wind turbines and will also identify possible cumulative impact. We have also collaborated with the Department of Homeland Security in an effort to develop a dynamic, flexible modeling tool to better analyze the impact of wind turbines on long-range radars. Currently, proponents are required to file a notice with the FAA as early in the planning po is possible, but no later than 30 days before the date of the proposed construction is expected to begin. That 30-day time frame has been in place for 45 years, and it was appropriate for single stationary structures that the FAA largely dealt with in that time and since. We certainly support consideration for requiring earlier notification to seek a more realistic time frame for the FAA to evaluate all the valid aeronautical comments, to review all pertinent analytic reports, and to issue determinations that take into account all comments and filings. We agree with the Department of Defense in its assertion that the technological improvements and sound research should go a long way to addressing the challenges presented by wind turbines. Better tools and modeling to ascertain the impact of a proposed wind farm on specific radar systems, plus more advanced signal processing to allow the removal of false targets will greatly improve the ability to deal with the impact on long-range radars. We will continue to work with the National Security Council, with the Congress, our partners in the federal government, and all interested parties to develop these improvements. Thank you for the opportunity to describe FAA's role in this very important process. This concludes my statement, and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions later. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Webster. Chairman Ortiz, Ranking Member Forbes, members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the American Wind Energy Association. OWEA represents 2,500 member companies, including project developers, manufacturers, construction firms, transportation providers, and others. My name is Stu Webster. I am Director of Permitting Environmental for Ibadrola Renewables. Ibadrola, which is headquarters in Portland, Oregon, is the second largest wind power generator in the United States with more than 3,600 megawatts in operation. We have operating wind power projects in more than a dozen states, such as California, including approximately 400 megawatts in Chairman Ortiz's district in Kennedy County, and we appreciate uh, the opportunity to do that. 
Wind energy is a critical national resource. It is domestic, inexhaustible, clean, and affordable. Wind energy is important for our national security, energy security, and economic security, as reinforced in the 2010 Quadrennial Defense Review Report. But if we don't have a better system for engaging with federal agencies on radar and airspace issues, including improved transparency with respect to DOD analysis on impacts and the ability to discuss potential mitigation, then wind projects will continue to be imperiled and we will not be able to meet our, energy's ne our nation's energy's needs. The wind energy industry recognizes that in some instances, depending on location, technology, and radar mission, wind farms can impact military operations. However, decades of experience in developing wind farms in the U.S. and around the world have demonstrated that wind turbines, radar, and military training can coexist. The industry has been discussing with DOD, FAA, DOE, and NOAA for several years possible process improvements including earlier engagement and mitigation options. All parties seem motivated now to move beyond talking to implementing those solutions. It is a we as hope that the ongoing White House interagency process facilitates implementation of these solutions. For the most part, wind power projects proceed without objections from DOD and other federal agencies. In instances, wind concerns are initially raised. Most are resolved after discussions between developers and the agency of concern. However, as the demand for renewable energy grows, there is a resource strain on reviewing agencies and concerns raised are impacting the ability of wind energy projects to be completed in a timely manner. What makes this issue so complicated is that due to the variety of radars, missions, and airspace needs, there is not a silver bullet solution that can solve every potential impact. As detailed in the appendices of my written testimony, there are many technical mitigation measures, and some of these are available today. For example, replacing older radars, roughly 80% of the nation's radars are from the 1950s to 1980s era, or upgrading software and existing radars has been shown to address concerns and accommodate additional wind energy development. This was done at Travis Air Force Base in California, and recently the UK government and industry announced the purchase of a TPS-77 long-range radar that can distinguish between aircraft and wind farms, which will free up approximately 3,000 megawatts of wind energy. Further, many of these solutions can be achieved at relatively low costs. A gap filling radar that costs just $250,000 allowed hundreds of additional megawatts of wind in Scotland with no decreased levels of detection at the radar. In other cases, more research is necessary. For example, there has been promising research on stealth composite blades, but the technology is not yet validated for U.S. radar systems. Federal investment in mitigation R&D needs to be increased to validate mitigation options. The goal should be to have as many mitigation options as possible, creating a toolbox from which different solutions can be pulled depending on the factors at a given location. Finally, I want to briefly comment on the specific language in the House Defense Authorization Bill. Industry has generally supported the language to establish a single entity that will centralize the review of wind projects within the DOD. This could improve transparency, consistency, and timeliness. However, we have concerns with language proposing the establishment of military mission impact zones in which it would be difficult, if not impossible, to site wind farms. In my written testimony is a map with red, yellow, green areas. The red represents circles drawn around radar assets at 30 miles, the yellow 30 to 90 miles. This type of mapping is a blunt tool that can put areas off limits even if site-specific analysis shows that there are no problems. Because of the different kinds of radar, different missions, and varying terrain among other factors, it would likely be unnecessarily restrictive to establish a one-size-fits-all rule for siting near a military asset of concern. In addition, there is no requirement in the language to balance national security needs with also critical energy security needs. Prior to designating a military impact zone, the Secretary of Defense should be required to seek public comment on the designation, release as many details justifying the designation as possible, explain the expected mission impact from the renewable energy development that led to the designation, and explain any changes to operations and technical mitigation options that the Department of Defense considered before making the designation. Finally, AWEA urges the inclusion of provisions requiring DOD to consider mitigation options such as radar upgrades and replacements prior to opposing a wind project, and there needs to be more federal investment in mitigation R&D. We need to solve the challenges the industry and the DOD are facing, and not just change how we talk about those challenges. 
These upgrades and replacements will have positive benefits to national security and air safety that reach well beyond the wind industry alone. The growth necessary to achieve 20% or more of our nation's electricity from wind, which DOE has determined feasible, is unlikely to be achieved without resolving radar and aerospace concerns. And these concerns cannot be resolved without cooperation between the wind industry and federal agencies. To that end, OEA recommends, one, developing an improved process for consulting agencies earlier. Two, establishing a proactive plan for upgrading radars to benefit national security, as well as accommodate additional wind energy deployment. And three, investing in significant research and development. I greatly appreciate your time today. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. I, 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 we, as it always happens, right in the middle of testimony, we have a vote. We have two votes coming up, but I'm just going to ask one question for now. Uh, Ms. Kalawaski, you, you mentioned that 100 thousand uh, projects have been approved, am I, am I correct? That can is you correct, tell, sir. Can you tell me how many of these 100,000 projects are close to military bases? N not off the top of my head, but I could get that information for you. In each and every case, uh, the projects that were close to military bases or military installations or close to the FAA's long-range radars were coordinated with the military and they had the opportunity to comment on it. In many cases, we were able to successfully work with the proponent and with the military in order to mitigate the effects uh, on the radar or on the military installation. Have you all taken into account uh, the old radar system that we have dates back to the 1950s? Yes, we have, and that, that uh, long-range radar system and the secondary radar system serves the FAA's mission quite well in terms of uh, evaluating the safety and the efficiency on the impact of the navigable airspace. Uh, it is the DOD's mission, of course, to use the long-range radars for their particular mission for the defense of the country. Uh, we work with them and they provide resources to us in order to maintain the long-range radar sites to ensure that that uh, ability is there for them to complete their mission. You know, one of the things that we worry about is that military installations bring jobs to our districts. We don't want the military or anybody else to come to us with any excuse and tell us, you know what? We're gonna to have to move our base because you are impacted by the wind farms. You know, the, the amount of wind farms dotting the landscape in South Texas is quite amazing to the south and to the north. And God knows we need the energy because we hope that we cannot continue to be dependent on, on foreign energy. But my installation at Naval Air Station Kingsville is becoming increasingly concerned. Should they continue to be concerned, or do you think that we uh, can pacify them because we do have a solution to this problem for anybody? Chairman Ortiz, I'll go ahead and address your question. Uh, the reality is that the wind energy is a broad and diverse group of stakeholders that uh, have varying levels of sophistication and understanding about how to go about developing a wind project. Uh, Evadrola Renewables has 400 megawatts in your district uh, near uh, the air station and as a result of our development efforts uh, cited that facility so that it didn't pose an impact. Um, to the issue at hand today, the projects that are potentially posing or are posing an impact uh, perhaps could be remedied not necessarily just by citing uh, changes alone, but the changes in the mitigation uh, and the technology that's out there. The surveillance community met in October 2008 
Uh, the wind energy was a minor line item in a large agenda that was primarily concerned with uh, the sophistication of the technology that they are currently utilizing. And it seems like this is a ripe opportunity to add the political momentum that wind energy has to address a much larger and longstanding concern with the surveillance community to upgrade uh, their facilities. In doing so, issues such as the air station in your district uh, could be mitigated and therefore remedied. You know, we have about less than three minutes uh, for the next vote. Mr. Garmandi, you will be first to ask questions when we come back, but uh, I think we should be back soon because I hope it's only two votes. Am I correct? No, it's three votes. <laughs> we, we're going to recess for a few minutes and then we'll come back. And I know that your time is very valuable. We'll try to come back and see if we can continue with this hearing. We're, we're recessed for a few minutes.